touch, and a fan of touch. Welcome back. Here we are celebrating an anniversary, I think the second anniversary, of the 45-45 league. Um, they regularly play both as teams and as an individual league. You can elect to play in either half, or maybe both, I'm not sure. Um, either way, they're doing a little six-hour celebration here. I doubt that I'm going to end up playing the entire event if I do. Um, then just expect that my commentary on the second half of my IRL tournament might be a bit delayed. But uh, I just wanted to play a few games here. I see we got some titled players with us today. Um, that's a little bit intimidating. Ten, nine, but we'll see eight, how far we get. Seven, six, I'm five, not going to consider going four, Berserk, although three, I know some players will. Two, one. Zero. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome E4. Uh, I forgot I have Maurice commentating. Five, Let me go fix three. that. F4. As exciting as that is. And let me also increase the board dimensions so we can properly see everything. All right. So this is a King's Gambit declined, uh, a line that I've often played over the board. Um, I've sometimes managed to even get an advantage out of this particular opening. I know many people uh, do accept the King's Gambit and try playing all the real theoretical stuff. Uh, my preference is just to opt for this sort of position, where inevitably white's going to play d4, and black's just going to get interesting central pressure. Um, like here I'm hitting that square, and if I take and then play bishop b4 check, um, it's generally what I've done over the board. Although I might want to think this through a bit. Um, maybe I want to actually try bishop b6. No, that just loses a pawn. So we're going to go with what I've generally played. Although here I might try bishop b6. Um, depending how afraid I am of e5. I think the theory dictates that I should play this check. Um, I don't know who my opponent is. However, I suspect that it's somebody quite well versed in this stuff. Which leads me to think that I'm probably playing being paired up rather than paired down in round one. Um, so black is a slight space deficit, which means black should focus on well, should not be afraid of exchanging pieces. Okay, I'm really concerned that white's like moving instantaneously. Either they're a novice who just happens to know a lot of opening theory, or I am in for a world of pain this game. Because um, I was out of book several moves ago. Like, even as far as playing bishop b4 check, I know that was book, but I don't understand the lines. I never took the time to study at all. And now here we are playing a game. This isn't a blitz game, even though my opponent seems to think so. Or just really knows the theory and doesn't care to spend any time thinking about it. Which is a popular thing to do. Um, generally here, I've opted for moves like bishop g4. Um, not in this exact position, but generally that's the sort of thing I play. I'm kind of confused as to whether I should go for that, or stick with the dogma of knights before bishops, or play rook to e8, trying to apply more pressure to the center. I really think this dogma of knights before bishops, though, makes a great deal of sense. It's just, if I play knight c6 and they play d5, what do I do? Um, so, yeah, this is unfortunate. Applying more pressure to the center makes some sense, although I'm not sure that that's going to help me force any kind of liquidation. Um, if I can force my opponent to play d5, say if I play c5, 
I don't even know if that forces d5 or not, but it forces d5 if it does. I don't have a... That doesn't benefit me in terms of having a diagonal for my bishop, because I already exchanged off the bishop. It does give them the d4 square, which I don't want to give up right away. Yeah, bishop g4 is my reflexive move, just to help me exchange pieces here. I'm just trying to understand, like, is that... Generally, I've gotten an inferior position whenever I play bishop g4 here, and I'm trying to find, is there anything better I can do? But this bishop has no future anywhere else, so bishop g4 makes the most sense. Like, if I could exchange off the bishop on this diagonal, or have it have some sort of future on this diagonal, that would be a great thing. Um, but yeah, I don't like black's position especially much here. I play this sort of stuff over the board just as a crutch to get into the game. But um, I have the sense that this isn't going to go well because they can play things like h3 and d5 when my knight doesn't have a home. But there's nowhere else for this knight to go. Like, I can't play knight a6, and if I play knight d7, I'm basically trapping myself. Um, so somewhere there's some move order nuance nonsense that I don't know of that would help me play better. Um, but this is the most that I know. And maybe if I did some sort of move order finesse in the opening, I could avoid this kind of position and get something slightly less painful. Um, sacrifice. Like what? Knight takes d4, just tossing my bishop away here? Or bishop takes h3, just losing the bishop for a pawn? I mean, I've done that in Blitz. It's worked against some masters, but um, this is like a 15-15 game. So at last my opponent is thinking, um, but I don't know. I don't like my position. Like, my thought here is to play something like rook to e7, queen somewhere, maybe queen d7, and then rook to rook a to e8. I'm trying to just put more pressure on e5, but there, I don't really see a point to it all. The other thing I should have probably spent more time thinking about, instead of playing this rook e8 reflexively, would just be push d5. And then plant my knight on e4 and hope I don't lose the game. Um... I don't think that that's, like, sound. Because if I play d5 and knight e4, there's a good chance they could get evicted by knight d2. And then I've opened up this beautiful diagonal and have no way to oppose these strong center pawns on the dark squares. Um, so... I didn't glance at my opponent's name, but I'm guessing that it's probably somebody 2,000 or above. Um, very likely somebody higher than 2,000, because they just blitzed out all the opening moves. And from what I can tell, none of it actually deviated from any games that I've seen. Like, generally you get a sense of if opponents, like, playing a wasteful A3 or H3... Or if they're playing some move that just seems really out of place in an opening, uh, Tabia. But here my opponent, I think, has played tons of Tabia moves. Um, that is putting all the pieces on the ideal squares. And has done so pretty instantaneously. Usually you can't get all your pieces on the perfect squares and you have to make some compromises. But here I've apparently just let my opponent run with it. Um, so this raises questions about should I take on e5 or should I run away? Uh, if I do run away, there could be a sacrifice on h7. Um, am I afraid of that? Am I afraid of that? Like if I had my knight on f8, um, there'd be nothing to fear, but it takes time to get there. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, so I see that, um, I see really negative things happening if I take on e5. Well, no matter what I do, there's a sacrifice on h7. So I'm just like screwed here, right out of the opening. Um, that's not good. Is there some way I could complicate this? Like, I don't know, does knight h5 somehow help contribute to the defense of the h5 square? I'm considering knight h5, sacrifice on h7, king takes, knight g5 check, king h6. No, there's the knight fork, king g6. Uh, queen d3 check. That loses my queen. I guess the point is that if they sack the bishop on h7, I just can't take it. Which is kind of sad. Um, so, maybe I play knight d5, let them sack on h7, play king h8. They're going to play knight g5 next. I could do something to cover my f7 square, and the whole time my knight on d5 is menacing this fork. I still have pressure on the d4 square. I have not given up the center. Um, and so now I'm debating, like, do I want to throw in pawn takes pawn first? Um, I don't think so. I don't think there's any benefit to me to doing that. So we're going to try this, and they're going to sack here. And I can't take it because then I get mated. Um, possibly if they take here, I have to play king f8 instead of king h8. That's my only thought, is that I'm losing the pawn, but I might not have to lose my king with it. Um, so how could I have avoided this? I guess the answer is don't play rook e8 play something like h6 so that there's no sacrifice and so that the g5 square is covered. So, um, yeah, this game went about as well as I expected any classical speed game to go. Um, like, if I were playing a legit 45-45 game, I'd have time to figure these things out and also be able to have time to play the rest of the game. As it is here, I could spend all of my time just trying to survive the opening, and I wouldn't enjoy it especially much trying to do it that way. So I'm just getting the loss out of the way as quickly as possible so I can move on to the next game and learn some more. The lesson from this game is uh, don't play Rook E8. That's really all there is to it. Uh, you have to play H6 in this line. Now, granted, there might be other lessons once um, after the game we go look at the opening explorer. We go look at um, what masters tend to play, as well as uh, what Stockfish recommends against me playing. Because surely, you know, maybe it's the combination of rook e8 and knight c6 that just leaves black in a world of pain here. I'm really confused how it is that my opponent is taking forever to come up with a sacrifice, given that they played like a perfect game as far as I can see up to this point. It would make sense to me that they just take on h7 and like have already figured it out. Yeah, bishop takes h7, it's a thematic idea that you'll find in the Laszlo Polgar book. Um, Getting into that position where the sacrifice can happen is difficult, but the sacrifice itself is pretty easy to calculate. So if bishop takes, king takes bishop, there's knight g5 check, and it's about as thematic as it gets. There's like nothing black can do to try to defend the king side, as both h7 and f7 are weak points. Ah, I see somebody's having some fun with um, 
when there are appearing to be song lyrics there. Yeah. I see there's a difference in opinions here. It wouldn't be fair for me to comment my own political opinions here, um, because that would like start basically a political, uh, I don't know, something where people are going to debate back and forth and back and forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, see, I think that that's like that's the problem there is that some people think it's funny some people uh have differing opinions and you're no there's no argument that's going to satisfy everyone yeah i know you want my opinion but also people are going to look at this video afterwards and some of them aren't going to want my opinion and they will very vocally say that they don't like my opinion so there's only so far I can go with that. Um, plus, uh, I am featured on Lee Chess at the moment, so I suspect they don't want me going into political tirades either. Um, plus, what do my thoughts matter? Okay, this is really weird. So there's a there's three threats in this position, maybe four. Threat number one, threat number two, threat number three, number four, number five, all bearing down on this. Um my Reflex reaction would be to play h6 here. Um, I'm also tempted just to throw in knight e3. It's like... I don't understand. None of this makes sense. I could also just take on e5. There's a whole lot going on here. Um... My opponent, I can't understand why, but they've elected to make this position very complicated. And a knight on e3 would cover a lot of important squares and would hit the queen and the rook. I am so confused. Okay, so if I play knight e3, they'd probably just play queen h5, and I am mega, super, ultra dead there. Um, so that's probably not best. Uh, f6, queen, h5, I'm curious if that just gets me mated by force or if it's just a terrible idea for me. Um, um, there's f5. Uh, f5, bishop, c4, loses my knight. Um, that's not so great. There's knight d4. Covers a lot of threats, um, but isn't capable of covering queen h5. So basically, my what the masters tell you to do is formulate a candidate move list and then iterate through it in some order. And if you get really stuck, go back and maybe enumerate some more candidate moves. So moves h6, f6, knight e3, knight d4. Any other candidate moves? I did briefly consider g6 at some point. It looks really weird. Anything but thematic, but um, my position's pretty weird to begin with, so maybe g6 is worth considering. Blunting that bishop, stopping queen h5. If my opponent wants to break through, they have to play f5, which takes time. Or they could play knight e4 and try to win an exchange, but I don't know that I'm so afraid of losing an exchange here when my king's life is on the line. 
Um, and when I'm threatening to fork the queen and the rook anyway. So, h6, bishop h7, king f8. Um, doesn't seem to lead very far. Um... <laughs> oh, we have a plethora of ideas uh, in our audience here. Oh, I, I forgot. I did mention f5 is a candidate move, but I had to rule it out due to bishop c4 losing my knight. But it is a candidate move. It's something I had to look at. Um, but yeah, we're definitely looking at like some kind of kingside pawn move. Um... Uh, so if h6, bishop h7, I can't do king h8, losing my queen um, to the knight fork on f7. If h6, bishop h7, king f8, I think there's still... Um, no, there's no queen h5 check, or made on f7 threat, because I can just take the knight there. Um... I mean, don't get me wrong, h6 is the reflex move here. It's just I'm really worried about bishop c4 in response. Um, particularly if queen h5 can somehow follow. Um, or if you know, bishop c4 and then they play knight takes f7, and I have no way to get out of the discovered threat winning my queen. Um... Although I might be able to get out with queen h4. That could be interesting. Yeah, I guess there's no benefit to playing g6 because losing my knight, um, or forcing me to move my knight and then they take on h7 is no good. So I have to play h6 here. Yeah, I'll say the other thing here is that this is a rated tournament, so unfortunately that means I can't really take your guys' advice. Um, I'm doing the best I can to try to... Unfortunately, it kind of takes away from some of the fun here. Um, but, yeah, it, it is what it is there, I guess. At least I think this tournament's rated. I'd go mouse over the corner of this page to figure out whether it is or not. I'm pretty sure it is, though. Um, which just means I can't take advice from people, because that would not be within the bounds of the rules. Wouldn't be fair, either. Um, yeah, that's okay. I will at least give her my thoughts on... Um, various ideas in this position. Yeah, so... I mean, there's always going to be these ideas that I... Uh, I'll say about any kinds of me capturing in the center and him recapturing. In general, the maxim is that he who captures first gives ground. It's so like if I take on e5 and my opponent takes back on e5, I've helped them bring a pawn forward, and meanwhile I've lost uh, my pawn. So, capturing tends to be a way of giving your opponent more space. Now, sometimes if you're exchanging pieces and such, giving up some space is not a terrible thing because you don't have as many pieces left to occupy your remaining space. Um... Yeah, like I was saying, like, knight e3 last turn, I think, ran into queen h5, and that's just lights out. Uh, so I had to play this move first. So now if they do queen h5, I just do pawn takes knight. And if queen h7, uh, my king escapes over to the queen side. Um, thankfully, I can escape through e7 and not get mated. Um... Yeah, I think what's probably going to happen here is bishop c4, pawn takes knight, bishop takes knight. Um, not sure what's going to happen after that, but I think that's the general direction this is going. That um, due to this double threat, 
uh, on this square. Um, I'm going to be forced to trade some knights. Now the question I think they're looking at is, do they take on f7 immediately here? Um, that would have been something... Well, I guess that doesn't affect my decision to play h6 versus g6. Maybe it does. Maybe that would have been a reason to play g6 instead of h6. That now if they sack on f7, I've lost all control of my light squares. That might mean something. I doubt it does, but it could. Um, yeah, my king can barely escape a mating attack here. Amazingly, I have not lost any material, although they have a bishop and I have a knight. Um, so some might argue in that this kind of open position that that's a big difference, particularly because all their pawns are in dark squares. Not all of them, but all the ones in the center that would obstruct the bishop's path um, are all in dark squares. So... I think that bishop plus pawn phalanx is a bit of an advantage for white. Um, in addition to the fact that like my development looks hideous. Um, no, I actually just did spot that immediately before you told me it. Um, but yeah, I'm able to support my knight on d5. I guess the concern would be that if somehow a pawn made it onto b5. Uh, and my knight were kicked somewhere else, that would be a problem. Also, it could be a problem as if um, I end up with my c knight on e7, and then they push f5, f6, and I lose my knight. Um, or they push f5, f6, and I have to start exchanging things, and my king gets exposed. Um, or, like, if I play knight c, e7, and they pile up with their queen and somehow find some way to uh, undermine my center or what little I have of a center, that would be troubling. Um, and to that end, it's been useful for me to just not take this pawn on d4 as well as not liquidate on e5 because that would end up with, probably with their d pawn on e5 and they would have an open d file to hit my queen and my knight and just take over the center. Um, I still think that there's probably some merit to knight takes f7. Like, okay, yes, I can support my knight on d5, but it looks sketchy for black. Just black looks super uh, low on space there. Something doesn't quite look right about it. I mean, I've seen there is an opening, I think, called the Cochrane Gambit, where white just sacks a knight on f7. And it's not sound. But good luck to black trying to hold it. Just because the computer can tell you that, um, yeah, it's holdable, doesn't mean that any human player is capable of holding such a position. Um, I am concerned that my opponent is, well, I guess this is a really pivotal point in the game. So I thought this was the easy line, where I just take the knight and there's no mate threat. Um... And my hand is kind of forced here, because if I don't do anything, they're going to take on f7 sooner or later. Um, well, it's not like I can play knight f6 or knight f4 or anything here. I could play rook f8, I could play queen d7, but I don't think any of these things improve my position, and they just leave me vulnerable to the same old nonsense. Like, if I play queen d7, bishop c4, knight c e7, bishop takes knight. Well, not... Bishop takes knight, but queen takes f7. Um, so if I end up with my knight on e7, that blocks me from defending f8. Um, so really, the only candidate moves here would be pawn takes knight and rook f8. And rook f8 looks ridiculous, because it stops me from taking the knight. And just gives him a free tempo to be able to like 
bring his rooks over to the king side. So I'm pretty sure I just want the knight. And I don't see a mate here, so we're taking that. Um, so I was confident here in king f8. Um, in fact, I believe that um, king h8 just loses on the spot. I'm pretty sure it does. I need my f pawn if I want to have any hopes of holding this. Um, yeah, so we're going over this way. I guess his plan is pawn takes, and then I do something to defend f7. Um, like here, I want to play queen d7, king e7, king d8. And it looks like I've just gotten away scot-free with this. I'm not seeing the problem. The only problem would be if I forgot to defend this f-pawn. Um, so we're going to try that. Noting that if I really need to play knight d8 to hold f7, I can do that. Uh, so actually, question. Do I play queen e7? Or do I play... Now, queen e7 would trap my king. That's not so great. But if I play queen d7, they've got bishop f5. I've got g6, they have queen h6 check, and I lose my queen. Um, this is a little trickier than it looked at first. So I guess queen e7 is forced, and then they lift their bishop. And they're threatening mate on h8. Um, so my first reaction to this whole position was just to play rook e7. Um, but if I play rook e7, they play bishop f5, they cover d7 anyway. There's no escape path there. So it's possible knight f6 might be forced. Um, That's pretty weird. That's pretty out there. Yep, see, this is the sort of thing that nobody thinks about until we get here, and then it's too late. Um. And, huh, another idea is like f6 or f5, just trying to run away from this uh, mess. Not f5, because I guess they just take it, but f6. Um, it looks painful. I might be able to survive it. Or I could just play a knight to e7 straight away. That would be... Wait, no, that doesn't defend f7. That's the problem. Um, yeah, I think f6 is possibly the only way to go. And it's not a very enjoyable experience. But it might be something I could survive. So as much as I appreciate you trying to help me cheat, um, I'm not going to take advice at this point. Um, yeah, I'm thinking that f6 might be the way to go here. As strange as it looks, it seems to be the only way to guard all the key squares and deny the rook access to f7, which was the key to all the problems in this position. Now, I think this runs into bishop e4. Um, and I still have plenty of problems to deal with. But um, there's no immediate mate in sight.
So yeah, this is tricky. This is kind of why I was considering knight f6 instead. Um, but I don't think that fares any better. Oh well. I mean, if you see a mate, at least I've made an attempt here. I've looked at, like, bishop g8 doesn't quite work here. Either pawn taking an f6, I just do a pawn recapture. Granted, um, it's super scary, and maybe there's some... Maybe, like, gf, gf, queen h6, king e7. Um, maybe there's some kind of mate somewhere in there. Queen g7, king e6, bishop f5. That might be it. Um, so maybe if GF I'm not able to recapture. Um, at least not with a pawn. If I'm not able to do a pawn recapture, it's going to hurt uh, to do a knight recapture. But um, but if that's what we got to do, that's what we got to do. The other thing is, I guess maybe if pawn takes like here queen h6 king f7 um oh there's the problem the f6 though being twice defended it's not no it's thrice defended i'm okay um we're gonna try this and if it loses i did my best but i'm down to a minute and i need time to figure out my other moves and looking and staring at this is not going to help me solve it Now, granted, I think that rook f5 and rook af1 is super painful here, but... Oh! Oh, that's cool. Wow. Nice. That is clever. Okay. So, this looks hopeless, but we're going to try it. There's g4 here, trying to exploit the pin. Um, I'm not sure that I have a good way out of this sort of stuff. I'm not going to give up the knight without some kind of fight here. So if I play king e7, I just get mated on the spot, so I have to play king f7. Um, but I think I'm probably losing heavy material. Oh, okay, okay. So now I have to play king e6 here, otherwise the queen loses its protection of this knight. So we play um, king e6. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right, that he takes an f6. And if I recapture, then he can play rook e1, separating my king and queen. No, I've got knight e6. Yeah, e5 here. Um, that doesn't quite work. Rook takes knight might have worked. I think he pins my queen. So he's able to give up two rooks to get a queen and a knight. Um, but he sacked the knight in the first place, so it actually wins material for me. My position's hideous, but I think taking both rooks off would be okay for me. Yeah, no, rook takes knight earlier, queen takes, he rook pins my queen, I successfully get two rooks for my queen. That's a good outcome. Prior to queen g6. No, I get that you're talking about this position. I think that trading two rooks for a queen is not a good exchange for white. Because I'm left with two rooks and a knight. Um... So I need to continue defending this as long as my king can't escape. And since my king can't escape, we have to run this way. Okay, and then we get to run back. The whole time I'm protecting this knight on f6. Right, so this sort of thing I'm concerned about. Um, this is where things hurt. 
so I have to give back the knight that he sacrificed. But also my king's getting smoked out. Um, so if king d7, queen f5 check wins the knight for nothing. So we're going to give the knight. You can have it. Just give me a tempo to get my king to safety. My kingdom for a tempo. If rook d1, then I play uh, knight d4 and c5 and just run like heck. So at the moment, I'm up a whole knight. If he trades queens, uh, this is actually probably a pretty bad endgame. Although, who knows, I might have something. Okay, so this prevents me from blocking a check using a knight. Uh, rook e6 would just lose, like, my rook. So we're going to run with the king. We're just going to keep running. Everything's going to be okay. Don't panic. <laughs> okay, so if king b6, he's got queen b3 check. King a6. Queen c4 check, b5, rook oh no, queen takes c6, and my king walks um, in places that it doesn't want to be walking. So I think the only, well no, king b5, queen c4 check. So there really isn't a good move here. We're going to try king b5. Well no, king b5, he's got a4 check, making things a lot easier. Um... We'll just try this. It's the natural move. If queen b3 check, I have king a6. Maybe even king a5. I'm trying to stay off the light squares here. Okay, so he does a sensible thing and just takes the piece. Uh, but this gives me a valuable tempo. And everything's okay. This is all going according to plan. Don't tell me you've never heard about uh, the king walk variation. No, I'm just kidding. This is not a variation, but um, this is fine. Nothing to worry about. Nothing is on fire. So let's just develop a piece. Heidi ho hum. I think if he'd played rook f3, threatening this, he'd be in a better position because c7's loose at the moment. But because he played rook f4, that kind of goads me into developing my queen because he can't snap on c7. So we just go back, you know. Just playing some pretty normal chess here. Nothing to worry about. Um, sure. Why not? Let's just take the second rank. Easy peasy. Works every time. I only play this reflex move because like any other thing he just like pushes a pawn and there's no attack anymore. I need this knight to protect my king. Knights work best at close range. So this keeps a whole bunch of pieces at bay. Um... All right, so is there any reason not to lift my other rook to g8? Um, there's rook g4, which would be a painful skewer. Um, hmm. yeah, let's just play rook e8. Connect the rooks. Good thematic opening ideas. I think black's position's okay. I'm overstating how okay it is, but I think it's okay. I don't think he found this move. I found it out of desperation because all my other moves are kind of bad there. But I've connected my rooks with that check in mind. And now we have a little threat of our own. We have another little threat of our own, would be, which would be um, this little rook lift, you know? So... Or this other rook going there, really. Doesn't matter which one. It's just a threat. It keeps him on his toes. Um, 
Okay, so he defends against the threat. I need another idea. I want to double on his second rank. I don't see anything better. So here we go, a doubling. Uh, I guess he could play rook c3. Pawns are even, but his pawns run way faster on the king side than mine run on the queen side. So I'd have to exchange a rook, but I don't want to exchange queens if I can help it. Um, all right, so now do I want to double rooks and exchange one set of rooks? Or do I want to double on the first? That's kind of annoying for him to deal with. Um, or do I want to play rook e3 and lose my rook to check? Probably not the last of these. Other options sound okay. Um, rook on e2 would be kind of nice. This is tricky. We're going to try this, only because it looks interesting. Okay, I didn't think you would do that. Um, I really didn't think he would do that. Okay, so we'll repeat once. Let's give him this to, oh shit. Well, that's a mouse slip, but that's okay. I intended rook e1, but that probably would have been a worse move than this anyway. Um, I don't know. Oh yeah, I guess there is the mate in one threat that stops him from doing rook c3. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um... Okay, so he's covering the e1 square. He doesn't have any checks here. Uh, I wish I could calculate this faster. I don't want to play queen b6. It just looks too kludgy, because he just pushes b3 and I don't have anything. Queen d7 seems slow, but I don't know what else I have. Queen d7 covers my 7th. That might be okay. That might be a good idea. Key to all of this ever having any chance is that there's no king and rook fork. If I lose that rook, I am cooked. Um, I don't think this is so simple for him to play. So I have queen h4, queen g2, rook e1, potentially, even though, like at the moment, e1's covered. Um, Okay, that's a free pawn. That is a free pawn if there ever was one. Am I taking it? I guess so. Check. All right, um, we can work with this. And then we go back to stop any other kinds of forks from happening. So I'm trying to set up threats on the first rank now. Um, I haven't given up like my e3. I temporarily gave up the d4 square and it worked out by luck. Um, yeah. So here I should probably just push my d pawn, um, assuming that losing c7 is no big deal. Because I think that actually having this pawn on d6 helps me if there's any tactic where he needs this queen to defend along this diagonal. Um, that tactic no longer works if the pawn's still on d6. Um, 
for example, if he takes on c7, rook e1, king h2, queen h4, rook h3, queen f4, if he plays g3, I have queen, well, I have queen f4 to begin with, which would not be possible otherwise. Um, but I might have better than all of that here. Like, if I lead off with something other than rook e1, my rook bearing down on the rank might be useful. Um... Also, queen d4 is a candidate move. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. This is tricky. I think queen d4 improves the positioning of all of my pieces. King f1 is not possible, uh, and that move doesn't really help him at all. So now we just take this pawn. So I'm still up a clean pawn, and he can't do any mate threats because I have queen h4 mate in response. Like, if he does rook g7, that's mate in 1 on h4. That's what coaxed me into playing this with my timer ticking like that. But now that I've covered b7, I can also consider rook to b1. Um, it's just, like, super difficult for him to try to hold this. Okay, he holds his pawn. It makes some sense. Um, so now we threaten first rank shenanigans. Uh, I've always got queen h4. I don't think it was winning because I do queen h4, queen f4 back and forth, and he keeps blocking with the rook, and if I sack my rook in the corner, the endgame is a pawn up endgame, but it's a very difficult one. Um... We're just compare that to this, where I've got queen e5 and rook h1, um, which just seems to be crushing. Um, but I might have better. Although queen g1 also looks strong. And I see other ways he could defend if I played differently. Sorry, I have no time to think and commentate. I don't think this is a good idea on his part. So this just asks me to lift my rook into position. Um, and his pieces are not very well poised to deal with this. Oh, who am I kidding? There's no mate here. Uh, I should play rook b5, however. And this position gets murky. Um, a rook to uh, b2 here seems strong. Mm, not strong enough. So, this is the part of the king's gambit where white's king goes out on a walk. Um, this a pawn stops me from playing rook b3, which is what I really, really want to play here. But it doesn't work. Um, but I've delayed the advance of his g pawn and put his king in a kind of a tight spot here. He's got pawn a4. That really makes this weird. Although I'm planning in that case rook g5 and queen takes g2. Um, okay, so we're going to apparently liquidate a pawn for d pawn if I go for it. I don't think I want to. Um... Let's go back. No, he's got threats of his own I've got to worry about. I've run out of time, and this is the only move I found before my time was about to expire. This is a bad move, but I freaked out. Um, 
So now we gotta try to hold this. It's not gonna be pleasant. So I need to get my king to the center ASAP. If not sooner. It helps knowing your rook end games, I'll give you that. Like, that allows me to play this with a very high degree of confidence. When otherwise, um, most players would be scared to go into this thing. I see that I've got this fork. I'm collecting one of the two pawns and any of the resulting end games. I can only, the advantageous player can only be me. Now, do I play rook takes pawn, or do I play b5? Rook takes pawn probably draws. b5 is greedy. Um, b5, g4, rook takes, g5. Oh, hang on. No, this is a trivial win. This just wins. And the reason it wins is because the king is cut off by three or more files. So his only attempt at a defense would be to lift his rook to d1. But my king boxes out his king. So he's just wasting time, so we'll take that time. We'll take it again. Okay. Um, question A3, rook B3, rook A6, not so bright. So we'll just go up. Also, if there is a draw here, um, if somehow I've missed something, I guess we'll look at it afterward, but knowing the endgame theory helps you make decisions about do I push the A pawn versus do I push my king forward. So it helps you from a practical perspective make it very difficult for your opponent to find any line where a drop might be possible. Um, but yeah, like I said, this king is cut off by three or more files, so this should theoretically be a win. And so the winning routine is that black lifts the rook onto b1 and then to b2. And that because the king is too far away, there is no draw. So, that was us defeating a 2100, round one. Um, we'll take a look at some of this. I uh, see if somebody's already started the computer analysis to find out, like, do I actually know my end games or not? Uh, let's take this from the beginning. Um, if I can scroll back up to the beginning position and then somehow filter this, where's my, here's the gear. We're gonna pick the masters database. So let's say we got this far. Let's scroll back up so we see the position. So c3, knight f6 is book, d4, pawn takes, pawn takes. Hmm, okay, so my memory didn't completely fail me. Bishop b6 is most topical. However, some masters have 
played or faced. Uh, bishop b4. I think both. Bishop d2 is book. Takes, takes. Actually, yeah, that's the only popular capture. Black castles. Bishop d3. Bishop g4 is a wasted tempo. Uh, this is apparently drawn most of the time. So there's a whole variety of results that occur here. But the point is that black is struggling for the draw in all of these lines. Yes, black did once play knight h5 with a 100% win rate, but all these lines are unpopular as compared to bishop b6, which is probably what I should have done to begin with. This bishop could have been useful in some sort of not only harassing the d-pawn, but if it's ever forced to go back behind um, my c-pawn onto c7, this is still a nice diagonal. So... I think the moral of the story of this little opening... Oh, interesting. Nobody tries to save the bishop. Okay, so we just castle. They push e5. We take... f takes, of course. Knight d5. Bishop g5. I think I've seen this before. Knight c3, b c3, queen d5. Bishop d3, bishop g4 at this point. And now if castle... Well, I mean, we're only following a handful of games at this point. Um, there's tons of ways black can play this, apparently. Um, Rook e8 is probably what I would choose, just because why not develop the piece? And yeah, you have all three results are possible in this position, though realistically a draw would probably never occur. So that's the opening theory in a nutshell. Um, here's our evaluation graph. It said white was winning until white played... Oh yeah, yeah, you remember this moment. Um, when I was saying queen b3 probably is the way white should proceed here. And instead white just took my knight. And I equalized and just got my king to safety. Um, and then shortly after that, my opponent, I don't know, self-destructed or something, but I didn't capitalize on it. Like back here, um, here, let's try this learn from your mistakes thing that I keep trying to popularize. Um, resume learning. So knight d5 is the move I selected. Evidently knight d5 is not a very good way to go here. Sorry, I scrolled by accident. Um, knight h5? No, okay. During the game, I was not optimistic about knight h5. Pawn takes pawn? Pawn takes pawn is good. The idea of... Oh. This makes it easier for me to hold some kind of center together. Um... Yeah, so as I was suggesting, this bishop h7 just kind of lights out. Um, I'm not seeing... Oh, okay, the critical difference? Wait, no. Pawn takes pawn. He still has a center pawn at this point. I was going to say the critical difference in some of this is that he didn't have that pawn on e5, but that's not the case. Why is this bishop h7 so good? Like in this line. It says king f8, queen d2, knight c e7. I guess the point is that black or white has an f pawn that they can race up the board and break open uh, my king side. Whereas if I do this pawn takes intermezzo first and then end up playing knight d5, then somehow the sacrifice is less good. In fact, no good at all. Well, it just equalizes. Um, presumably because I've like crippled white's ability to attack me. Okay, but if that's the case, then why not pawn takes this way? Pawn takes this way is okay. And now Stockfish is thinking knight h5 here. And during the game I was saying, well, I don't think knight h5 is very good because white can just play stuff like this. But... Yeah, I was considering g6 at some points, even though it's kind of weakening. I guess my point is that 
rookie eight in the first place is the real mistake. And that just makes it so easy for me to F things up later. Oh, taking on g5. Um, interesting. So there was something better here. Um, I'm very hard pressed to find this in a real game. Like, f7 is loose. Do I just play rook f8? Rook f8's the move. Just go back and cry. But apparently that's the way to pursue that. Oh, should I just take here? Okay. Yeah. I was in time trouble at this point. Did I make any more mistakes? Queen c3. Uh, that's interesting. How can black possibly improve on this? Um improve over, say, queen d7. Is queen e4 an improvement? No. Is queen takes queen an improvement? No, not at all. Um, either I vastly underestimated my chances here, or yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, is queen b6 an improvement? Okay, that was the other move I mentioned during the game. It's hard to believe that it's that much better um, than queen d7. Although, I mean, yeah, b3 or b4 stuff I was looking at. Oh, he just hangs the a pawn. Okay, this guarantees black gets a pawn for his troubles. Yeah, queen takes c7 is a blunder. Uh, do I just like rookie one somehow mating? This in many positions had occurred to me. Here I did. Oh, I thought there was queen c5 check. There is no queen c5 check. Um, as such, white is just running and running and running and running. Uh, but how does this mate? Queen to e4 threatens queen h4 mate. We got this check, this check, this check. Apparently black's way better here for some reason. And then queen f5, king g3. Uh, I'm not sure that I can trust what Stockfish is telling me here. It seems like it's just dancing about trying to find the winning blow. Let's make Stockfish look a bit deeper. Um, I don't know that I believe Stockfish here when it says Queen E3 wins, Queen E5 wins, everything wins apparently other than the moves I play. Okay, I can start to believe that if we're chasing the king to F2, there might be something there. I don't think this is so simple, however. Rook f3, queen g5, king f2. No, queen d2, absolutely not. That's just a repetition. Okay, queen h4, possibly. That could maybe be it. Um, King e3, rook e1 check, king d2, queen e4. Holy moly, if I find anything like that, even in an over-the-board game like at FIDE time controls, that would be amazing. There's no way any human player is going to find all of these. This, like, queen e5 check... Well, not only that, but uh, what led up to this was rook e1. I found rook e1. In many lines, I found queen b1. Here, I thought it was refuted by queen c5, which simply doesn't work. But if you find all that, then you might find like this 10 moves by each player, which land us in this position where black still has very strong threats and g2 is loose and 
really the most amazing thing about this is like G3 doesn't work due to mating 14. Um, so that's why Black's able to put all his pieces on the edge of the board. Um, and there's no perpetual check there, and White's not mating Black in any of this. This would have been difficult to find in that situation where I had like 20 seconds left. Um, but that would have been the right way to play it. Regardless, uh, I'm going to bookmark this just so I can remind myself. Don't play bishop b4 check. I think that's the biggest lesson there. Alright, so we got a queen pawn opening. Who doesn't enjoy a queen pawn opening? Oh, we got a queen's gamut accepted. How do you play this stuff again? Is it knight f3 and knight c3 and bishop g5 in general? Um, bear in mind I've mostly played e4, so playing d4 is outside my comfort zone. Um, I'm learning a lot here, but it's hurting a lot to do all this learning. <laughs> okay, so queen a4, picking up the c pawn is okay. This bishop g4 just, like, screams for me to play knight e5. Like, knight e5 is a clean extra pawn, and I'm threatening queen b3, hitting this b7 pawn that's undefended. Um, I don't understand what black is doing. I could do queen a4, knight c6, knight c3, bishop f3, and I'm hanging my pawn. It's probably not wise. Okay, so we'll pl pretend that this was uh, Trumpowski. Um, but really it's not. No, I've got this interesting center. And if he plays f6, I could lose my knight by playing this check. That would be glorious for a brief moment, and then afterward it would be pretty sad. Um, okay, so I've got knight c3 here, right? Unlike a normal Trompowski, here I'm up a tempo, so I could pretty much do anything, I assume. So both candidate moves. Queen f3 a4, knight c3, and then some kind of stupid sack something or other, which I don't think works. Um, queen f3, bishop d5, e4, bishop b7, queen takes f7, mate. Probably good. Queen f3, queen d5, um, e4, queen takes d4. Probably not so good. Knight c3 threatens to improve on all those lines and gives me a mating threat. Um, that seems fun. Hmm. This is weird. So, like, queen f3 would win on the spot if you were forced to play bishop d5. But because he has other moves, um, like queen d5, it's not necessarily good. Um, yeah. It's so tempting, though, because, like, if it works, it, it's just, like, beautiful. Um, but there's too many loose things in the center for me to make that work, so I have to start with a4 or knight c3 here. A4, he probably plays F6, and I take, and he takes my knight, and that's no fun. I think knight C3 is an interesting approach, though, because now my threat of queen F3 hitting this rook in the corner is renewed. Um, that's one way to not lose the rook. But now I also have D5. Like... I'm just powering through this. This is this is going to be a smash. Um, or a miniature, I guess. 
Uh, so. Do I play d5? He's up a pawn. I'm not really worried. Like, usually I'm pretty materialistic. But here... Eh, it would be very difficult to be materialistic in this position. If d5, f6, pawn takes, queen exchange, and he takes my knight. That's not so great. So, it would be sensible to develop my queen. I've already covered d5. He's kind of forced to play rook a7 or c6. Actually, c6 covers the d5 square, but leaves him in a pretty crippling bind. And I could always play knight e4, knight c5. It would be so difficult to be materialistic in this position. Like, I don't know. Possibly black's better already due to having the extra pawn, but I don't believe it. It seems too optimistic. Um, so I'm debating, do I want to follow with bishop e2 or bishop d2 and castle one way or castle the other way? Uh, I was actually thinking, though, c6 is probably the sound way to address this. And I didn't see c6 until after I played my move, which is bad. Um, that's, like, super bad that I didn't see c6, because that probably refutes my entire scheme here. But if we pretend that this move was forced, then this is suddenly a brilliancy. Um, so, none of you guys saw nothing, right? That rook move was forced, somehow. Hey, what's up? We're just playing some 45, 45, 15, 15 nonsense here. Um, nonsense is the wrong word, but I just find it funny that we have a two-year 45, 45 commemoration celebrated by a 15, 15 event. Okay, it's good to have something. But, yeah, it's just funny. I did see that some masters had signed up for this tournament, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm sure they're fighting like heck. And meanwhile, here I am, um, just doing my thing. Okay, that's a free bishop. Let's take the free bishop. Do you see why it's a free bishop? Do you see why that's a free bishop? Oh, hey, look, we found a good move. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, why didn't he try knight d7? You know, I think quite a few things were probably missed that game. Um, for my part, if I weren't so embarrassed by that game, I would go back and look and try to study... Um, what should have happened that didn't happen there? Well, that's funny. Our number one and number five players are playing 15-15, and White just sacks his queen for a pawn to promote his other pawn. He's like, I'm not even going to bother calculating the fastest, most efficient mate. I'm just going to promote another pawn. And Black sees this and says, you know what? Maybe it's time to play a new game. That's funny. Um, I'm sure there were tons of ideas that were missed there. Feel free to critique, criticize, provide feedback of sorts. Uh, I don't think I played that Queen's Gambit especially well. All right, e5, best by test. Come on. All right, so. We're just going to play Old Faithful here. If the Rui happens, my favored defense is Knight f6. At least at the moment, that's the case. Yep, we're going to Berlin this up. Granted, it's probably easier to play the Berlin at 30, 30 or slower than it is at faster time controls, but we're going to do it. 
and learn something from having attempted it. Now one thing is suppose they play like c3 or something here. We could play bishop c5 and transpose back to the classical lines. Um, debating whether or not, I mean, they'll probably play d4 or castle, but if they don't, we have some transpositional options on our hands. Oh, come on. You know, who plays the Rui and has never seen this before? I think my opponent's, um, yeah, making a decision between do which of the lines that he knows is he going to play as opposed to they've never seen it before. That'd be really weird um, to go into the tank on move five in the Spanish opening. Well, that's move four, isn't it? There's a pawn e4, knight f3, bishop b5. So yeah, move four would be castle. Going into the tank on move four either means you've played way too much blitz chess or you're making some sort of decision based on which move that I know would I prefer to play today. And it's totally fine to like take your time on opening moves, um, even though for openings you know. You can make decisions about um, how you want to play it. So... What I'm trying to decide here, uh, I think thematic is rook e1, but pawn takes pawn. I think I'm supposed to play knight e4. And then takes takes, and then knight c3 could happen. This is not good for me to be... Um, was it? No, it's not knight f5, because there's then there's no pin there. Um, uh, I'm going to have to look away from my chat window. While I remember what the theory was, it's either knight f5 or knight e4. It's one of those. Um, I'm almost certain it's knight e4. I'm just trying to remember how do we get into that weird line where I end up with a piece on d4, but I have a pin against his f3 knight or something. I would suggest that I play knight f5, something happens and my knight ends up on d4 and I get a bishop to pin his knight, but that can't happen while... that must be a different line. Um, yeah, knight e4 to c5 to e6 is okay. Um, knight f5 just puts my... Oh, wait, no. Knight f5 explains how my knight gets onto g6 in many lines. Hopefully I haven't crossed my lines here, but... Like, there's no path from e4 over to g6 so conveniently. Yeah, no, it must be this. I'm still confused what happened in... Like... Eh, whatever, we'll play this. Because I know you got lines... I thought there was some line where bishop g4 ends up happening. And then black white ends up taking on d4. And black captures on f3. And then later is able to exchange queens or something. But that's not this line, evidently. So yeah, here... Okay, g4... I think g4 is premature. It's very difficult to support that pawn. So now I'm able to follow up with h5 and hack at... Well, this is the base of the pawn chain. But um, even giving him a tempo to play h3, I'm still hacking away at the base of this pawn chain with h3 and then taking. And then g4 is loose. Usually white precedes all this play by playing h3, king h2, 
and some other preparatory moves to ensure that g4 and f4 advance without hanging. Here, I don't think g4 early like that works. Okay, bishop d7 is a trap because he plays e6, pawn takes knight e5. Uh, obviously knight d5 just gets the knight pinned and lost, so we have to proceed like this. I still have this threat. I still cover the d7 square. Like, if black loses d7, then black starts to feel some pain. But it's not until that goes wrong um, that this is, like, this is not at all advantageous for white. Right, so he plays h3. Now if he pushes g5, I just take the free pawn. This point. Um, so uh, if he does that, I have a choice of which pawn to take. I think I'd probably just take h3. I mean, I don't think it even matters here. Well, no, if I take on h4, h5, he plays h4. I could play knight g6 to try to add pressure, but... Um, I think taking h3 is the sound way to go here. Because there's, it's impossible for him to hold h5, but if he gets a pawn in h4, that actually puts up some resistance. Uh, on the flip side of that, it'd be really nice to get rid of this h5 pawn immediately so I could play knight g6. I just think that puts my king under some fire. But either way, this whole thing... Caught me very much by surprise that he played this at all. Or she. Um, so I'm taking one of these two. Um, the greedy side of me wants to develop the rook. Because uh, I think I can get the h-pawn with tempo. The saner side of me says, like, taking with the rook and he plays h4 and then I play like a knight move. Uh, leaves me kind of vulnerable for a tempo on my back rank and really complicates everything, so I'd rather move the bishop first. How about bishops before rooks? Can we make that a thing? We're going to do bishops before rooks and see if that ends up being a reasonable policy here. Um, so h5 is hanging the whole time. Um... If he plays like rook d4, I don't know why he would, but I've got knight f5 here to secure my bishop against any kind of rook behind his pawn sorts of ideas. Amazing. Simply incredible. A gambit. Um, this I've never seen before, and probably with good reason. But this does complicate things ever so slightly. So if I take on h6, I get in the way of my h file. Um, that's about the only negative aspect of taking it. If I push g6, <laughs> I've got bishop takes pawn. And so that way I keep my h file and I still collect the pawn. And because this knight hasn't developed, there's no knight f6 immediate threat, although knight f6 will come. Oh, that's, okay, that's the other aspect of this, is that taking on any kind of capture there is going to lose my f6 square. I've already lost f6 in a sense. My opponent offers a draw. That's very thoughtful of them. Um... I'm trying to deal with the fact that I'm actually kind of worried about what's going on on this king side. Um, this is really complicated and interesting, so I'd prefer not to take a draw at this time. Plus it really doesn't help with the tournament format and getting good opponents. So g6, knight c3, bishop takes, knight e4. Why don't I just take this? Play rook g8. I want to take this. I want to see where this goes. This very likely will hurt a lot 
but if it doesn't, then I'm a genius. So <sighs> that's the trade-off. Um, so if knight c3, I've got bishop g4, kind of inducing either a rook move or a king move, after which I've got like other stuff I can do. And that's all if knight c3 happens. If he does knight uh, bd2, I'm not sure what he's doing next. Yeah, so knight c3 is the predictable thing, going for the f6 shot. Um, <laughs> now, wait, do I do an intermezzo with rook g8 here? Or does that just make my life difficult? I think the latter. I think it doesn't help me at all. Um, yeah, we're just going to pull back the bishop. And if knight e4, then I play bishop g7, and f6 is covered. Nothing to worry about. Or supposing that f6 isn't covered, maybe I just play f5. Or just move my knight. Um, this knight e4 doesn't have to be scary. I mean, usually it's scary because usually... Well, I'm sorry. Now, if he plays knight e4, uh, he's threatening a fork here. That hits my bishop and my king. So I can't just completely ignore it, but I don't think it destroys me either. Um, so I can debate playing knight f5 here, threatening a fork that is like very difficult for him to deal with. If I do knight f5 and knight h4, um, it's not so clear that white has a way to protect this knight. Although knight h4, king g3, bishop takes, maybe he saves this rook. I'm not sure how, but maybe there's a way. What, why knight f5? Why not knight g6? Knight g6 is the thematic move in this opening. Plus it bears pressure on his um, e-pawn. So I'm just threatening to snatch the e-pawn outright. Um... I guess the downside that I didn't look closely at at all was that he's got king g3 here. Which I should have looked at, but I guess king g3, bishop takes, king takes, knight takes, pawn check. Probably is the end of that variation. Um, you guys see this, right? That I can just take this pawn for free? Like, for free, for free? Like, no strings attached? Okay. We're taking it. Um. Okay. You don't see... Oh. Okay. I'm just blind. Like, I thought that that knight was pinned. Okay, well, that makes things a little bit different, uh, to say the least. Still, it's not terrible for me. I mean, yeah, that is embarrassing. Um, man. I was thinking about food. I'm going to be honest. Um... I had some decent food before this uh, broadcast started, but it was very high in sugar. So, um, if you're going to play an over-the-board event, don't do that. Yeah, this makes things more interesting for sure. So, let's activate the rook. I should have just taken that on f3 first, and then taken on e5. 
Uh, although I get my knight pinned the other way around, so... So this all started with me, like, having doubts about knight f5 versus knight g6, and then hurriedly playing something. Admittedly, I'm down, like, a minute and a half, and I've played too much blitz chess. Um, but I should have calculated that better. I should get out of the habit of playing blitz chess. At least at a pace which requires me to play before thinking. Because that develops a bad habit. So I have bishop c5, f6, and bishop g4 coming. Can I change up the move order to make that any more powerful? Bishop c5, rook somewhere. Does that rook somewhere help him or hurt him? Um... Okay, so candidate moves. Bishop c5, f6. Um, let's look at f6, because it looks simpler. f6, knight moves somewhere. Um, I guess somewhere is either d3 or c4. And then after he's moved, I could play bishop g4 check. Um, if the knight's on d3 then I can't follow with bishop c5 pinning the rook to the king. So playing f6 first has the disadvantage that it prevents me from playing bishop c5 later. Um, so unless I have some sort of mating threat, which I don't because I'm down a piece, and I, yeah. So bishop c5 has got to be it. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention c5 is a candidate move. I briefly looked at it and then just noped it. Because, like, it doesn't develop anything. It obstructs my bishop. Um, it's tempting, but it just doesn't do anything. The other thing in favor of this move is that this does hit the rook and gain some squares. But also, like, the only square where his rook, only two squares where he could hit my bishop, are both covered already. My bishop covers all this. That's not how bishop moves. This is how bishop moves. So... Yeah. Uh, okay, that's a point in favor of playing f6 first. I've already moved my king, right? That's definitely part of this opening. Um, so I could throw in f5 instead of f6 here. Which would force his rook to move again. Um, I want to play f6, I just can't afford to do it right here and now. And my king is too boxed in for me to try to do it later. Uh, I could do bishop h3, threatening a skewer. Although he has to discover check that kind of turns things around. And my bishop on c5 is loose. So, there is no, like, natural move in this position. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got bishop f5. I disregarded it earlier because, like I said, it allows rook c4. Um, but that's not the end of the world here. Um... The thing I really want to do here... I guess would be rook d8 and then rook lifted on somewhere on this file. But that's not effective. It just doesn't work. Meanwhile, he's threatening to move his knight to a variety of different squares. And I don't have an effective counter for every one of those. I could play bishop e7 so that my other bishop's free to move, but it's not going to pin this rook. Uh, so it's kind of weird. Um, rook d8, knight moves or bishop takes pawn, rook d4 or something, it merits some thought. Um, the other thing I could do with regard to all this is just play h5, and if he moves his knight, check him. No, my bishop's pinned. 
If he moves the knight to d3, I could retreat my bishop and then eventually manage to check him. Um, I think this pawn will prove useful in the future. And my only other way of defending it would be rook, G, or rook h8 here. I don't want to play rook h8. It looks no fun. Um, h5, knight a4. Bishop here, rook back, knight, or bishop e7. Um... It's tricky, but I think I need this pawn if I have any chances here. All my hopes and dreams lie on that pawn because um, I lost my knight earlier. I do want to briefly look at, and I shouldn't do this during a game, but I want to. Yeah, no, I take your check and then I take e5 check. That's what I should have done. Okay, so there's no doubt in my mind anymore about that. Both of those moves were check. That would have been an okay way to play. I was not forced to go into this. Meaning, um, because I wasn't forced to do this, um, it's probably not good. Like, sometimes in chess you're forced to make moves you really don't want to make. And um, in those cases you'll find that you have all these unexpected counter chances that you wouldn't that really shouldn't be there, but just somehow work. But since it was entirely optional for me to sack my knight like that, um, the odds of this working are pretty low. Now, I should also consider that earlier this game my opponent offered a draw. Um, which either means that they're far higher or far lower rated and are really thinking about ratings, um, I think. Okay. I don't even know if that's going to matter the way the game plays out, but it could be a relevant factor. Um, so I've got rook h8, and then king f8, and then lift my rook to d8 there. Is there any other intermezzo that I could do to try to complicate this? I don't think so. I think my options are... Well, I could do f5 and then bishop f7, but this just loses my bishop to knight d3, discovered check. So that's probably not the way to go. See, so yeah, rook h8 is kind of forced. Um, yeah, if I said bishop g5, I'd probably mean bishop g4. So... I guess the next couple moves will reveal um, if my opponent's able to form a coherent plan when they are up material. Uh, we'll see that soon enough. They've done very well in activating their pieces, although the means by which we got here might not have been sound. Um, <laughs> I was debating bishop g4, check here, and then pawn takes um, his knight when he takes on g4. Problem is that knight takes g4 would be a discovered check. I really need to get my king out of there. Oh, is the clock that freaky? Huh. I thought most of this is just Zen mode. Um, I never really thought about the clock being that freaky here. Unless I'm like using a different font or than you are or something. Maybe that's the case. All right, so this I debated Bishop B six. I've also got Bishop E seven. Um, b6 would not immediately give up the c pawn, but I'm not sure that I need that pawn. Um, like that pawn I might be willing to give up. 
On the other hand, bishop e7 gives me a free tempo to move this bishop around, which would be a really nice thing to do about now. Uh, b6, he would play knight a4. Um, I guess I move my king. He takes my bishop. I have to take back. I'm hitting this pawn. He somehow defends that, and then I pin his rook or skewer him or something on this diagonal. Some shish kebab, something or other happens there. So, yeah, I think bishop b6 is a reasonable way to run. We're going to try it. The one key point is that I'm not losing this bishop with tempo, or not exchanging it with loss of tempo either. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Um... And I guess a standard way of displaying Lee chess, normally the clock is gray or something. Um, that makes me think that when we're in Zen mode, I don't need to make the clock so bright and bold colored here. Maybe in Zen mode it would make sense for me to tone that down a bit. Um, maybe pick a lighter color like a yellow or... Something in between what we have and, um, well, you know what I'm trying to say. Okay, let's get the king out of all this. So now my bishop is free to move and snap this pawn. But more importantly, to do this kind of stuff, which we all know is about to happen here. I say we know, but... There's no way we can know that for sure. Um, I don't want to snap the pawn also, because there's always this uh, pawn b3 trapping the bishop. Got to watch out for that. Oh yeah, no, I, I get that. Like, if you're trying to win the event... Um, <laughs> okay. Um... If you're trying to, like, get that trophy, if that really means a lot to you, uh, then Zen mode is probably not for you. Um, but and it seems funny for me to say that, because I created a team on Lee Chess called the Berserkers, you know, before Ultra Bullet was a thing. Um, just largely created it for the silliness of having created it. Um, okay, so I want to play king g8 and if necessary king h7. I don't believe that he's mating me. I could be wrong. Either way, it's too late now to start figuring out these... Oh, no it's not. Oh, it's not too late. King g8, rook g1, king h7, knight f6 mate. That's unfortunate. Wow. Well done. Um, optically, this puts up more resistance. Optically, this puts me subject to this skewer here. But in reality, it doesn't matter, because rook g1's the way to go. That is really cool. Hmm. Well, at least that spares me the agony of trying to defend a lost endgame. I'll just go over here. You know. <sighs> Bummer. I thought that with this knight on d7 I could still have king f6. It's not there. So the question is, does he find the mate in one, or does he just like run down my time, or his time, or however that goes. There we go, he found it. That's me losing to a 1200. Well played, sir. Okay. Um, we're going to go on to the next game. 
All right. Yeah. So that's part of the risk of playing... Like, okay, sure, there is some risk in playing the Berlin. But also trying to win with the Berlin brings in some risks. Alright, so... We're facing the Berlin again. Uh, this time we're not going to lose right out of the opening. Um... So, I'm trying to remember. There's some tricky variation here, but this isn't it. And I think of queen h5, I just have bishop e6, and there's nothing to worry about. Yeah, so black is totally equal here. I am shocked that white is playing so rapidly. Um... This is what I do in this opening. I'm not saying it's book, but it's what I do in Blitz. And white's totally fine playing knight e5 there. Um, so I'm not thinking that white knows this opening. Um, I might be underestimating uh, my opponent, but um, I don't think people study this particular sub-variation of the variation. So I'm thinking probably again, I got paired down again. Probably I'm doing okay. Um, this is just a game. This avoids all the, like white got us a pawn structure where White has a small space advantage, and black doesn't have any meaningful pawn breaks. So theoretically, this is a very minuscule positional advantage for white. But that doesn't mean that white can't try to win with that. It just means that it's difficult to do so. So much so that people generally prefer to play other moves. But that's okay, you can still play this. Um, so I'm debating, do I throw in some queenside pawn moves to try to break up this tension? Um, mm -hmm. this looks sensible. And I could play rook a6 and then b5. Okay. I could also play g6 now that this bishop can't get onto h6 anymore. It's nice to keep the rooks connected on the back rank. Um, I kind of want to play rook a6 and b5 just to see where it goes. Although we saw last game I was curious about where something went and we saw where that ended up. Um, wait, no, b5 immediately just lets me get the d4 pawn with check. So b5 immediately is probably pretty good, as long as I'm not losing this rook in the corner. b5, queen takes, queen takes check, bishop e3. Um, probably loses the rook in the corner. So I guess rook a6 first is necessary. Or g6 and lifting my king up and trying to get out of this pin and then maneuvering my knight to d6, then ultimately to e4, which like takes an eternity, might also be okay. Um, let's try this. If for no other reason than if white refutes this, that's one more thing that I know over the board I can't play.
so. Um, trying to think of what else to comment on here. Okay, so the obvious idea was b5 and then b4, or b5 and then a4 even. Just getting the queen off this diagonal so I can move all the rest of my pieces. I'm not seeing any reason to deviate from that. Let's do it. Alright, so he's moved the queen away, so now my knight can move. Um, but I also want to kick this knight while it has nowhere good to go to. And I'm just being careful not to hang my rook this time. My bishop does cover the rook, so b4 does not immediately lose all my stuff. We'll find a way to hang the rook, but not now. Give it time. We'll figure it out. But um, for now, this is okay. Although this leads to the knight having a very nice home there. It would help if I found that before I moved instead of after. Um, okay. I could, no, bishop b7 walks into a fork. I can't really do that. Um, yeah, so I just have to acknowledge that I've let this knight into my living room. Um, oops. Okay, so do I play like queen e8 or something? How am I going to hold on to the c pawn? Assuming I hold on to it. Queen c8 seems okay because there's so many pieces. Well, I'm also tempted to just take the damn knight here. That makes it much more difficult for my remaining pieces, but want to do that. But also, I'm tempted to play bishop e7 and then snap the knight on c5. And then we both have doubled c pawns in a symmetrical position where absolutely nothing can happen to either player. Which is basically what a lot of chess players enjoy, is just when nothing happens. Um, no, I should do queen d5. This covers the c pawn. This is adventurous. We'll find a way to hang the rook later. Um, but for now, this is activity. It would help if I could like simultaneously move this bishop away, play c5, and then get my rook over to g6, all without losing any material. If I could play all those three moves at the same time, and not lose the rook to this knight takes rook, uh, that would be cool. But we're not playing Kung Fu chess. Um, we're playing just normal chess, and that means things aren't so simple. Meaning I'll probably have to take the long route through A8 to E8 to E6 to G6. I don't really have much else planned at the moment because he barricaded my queenside pawns. Although, the way these pawns are structured makes it very difficult for him to advance as well. Um, he's interested in collecting that c-pawn. Okay. Now am I going to do this stupid thing where I take the knight and with one of these pieces? Or do I exchange queens just to get a tempo? Do I play bishop e6? because I don't need the bishop covering the rook anymore. And invites him to play knight c5, um, so we don't want to do that. Okay, well, we're, I guess we need an end game here. I guess we need an end game. I've got rook e, rook to d8. Um, It's like the only way I can assert some pull in this position. And that's a pretty weak pull, but it's a pull. Wait, I could play bishop d7 and just lose a piece. That'd be a great idea. I seem to be good at finding all these ideas that aren't that good. 
Um, that's to say I'm good at finding candidate moves, most of which aren't um, always the best move. Uh, Bishop h4 seems not terrible. With the idea that it just gives me the tempo to do that rook lifting thing that we were discussing. Um, only because I'm terribly bored I want to play it. He plays g3, we exchange knights, and I play c5, and I'm threatening to bring the rook over. Actually, he plays g3, we trade knights, forcing him to take um, d5. This is the hope. Um, it's a bit optimistic for sure, but I don't want to give up this d5 square. I don't want to abandon my post. And if I could get my pawn onto d5, um, then I have a bishop here in what is admittedly a closed position, but I have some chance of having a pawn break to open things up later. And if we get the pawn break, then we can win the end game, maybe. Um, all this because I just misplayed somewhere in this opening. Right, so we're going to get this double bishop end game. He's got to take my queen now. We recapture. And then he has a choice. Okay. That was pretty quick, um, not going to lie. So his thought is that this endgame's got to be good for white. My thought is it might be unclear. We have different shades of opinions of this particular position. Um, one little thing worth noting is that I collect a pawn immediately with threats of collecting more pawns and threats of trying to mate on the king side. Um, I need to stop knight d4 before it happens, so this is how we stop it. He could take on a5, I wouldn't recommend it. But he would, so there's that. There's two ways to look at any given position. Um, My take of this position is that since I've delayed e6, I can have enough counterplay to make up for the fact that these two pawns oppose my bishop. Um, not sure what his opinion is. So now I could exchange rooks and play rook a8 and collect the a pawn. Or there's no need to exchange rooks for this attack to occur either. I'm going to try to liquidate all these pawns here, but also I'm trying to mate his king. Um, which is really only possible if I play d4 here. Um, before I commit to all that, we have two candidate moves, d4, rook a8. If rook a8, rook c6, or rook e7, look really unpleasant for me, but might not lose, um, but probably do. On the other hand, d4 allows me to play bishop d5, uh, which looks quite favorable. So unless there's some huge optical illusion here, uh, then d5, uh, d5 to d4 has got to be the move. Um, but if there is some optical illusion, this is my one chance to save it. Um, The other thing to watch out for is he's got this knight c6, knight e7, hitting my bishop and my king thing. So if I play d4, you can play knight c6 immediately. Um, and it's very difficult for black at that point. But that's not to say that uh, I should avoid that. It's just to say that's one thing to be concerned about. It's one concern among many. Possibly d4, knight c6, king h8 might be the way to go here. And then you might play knight e7 anyway. Whereas if I play rook a8, he's got rook e7. And then my bishop, I could go back to f7. He plays e6, I'm basically lost there. 
Um, well, strategically lost. Tactically, there might be some way to get me out of it. Strategically, if this pawn moves up, I'm screwed. But um, strategy might take a backseat to tactics in this position. So d4, knight c6, bishop takes a2 might be the thing here. Let's try that. <laughs> Only because I think I've hit a point where I don't believe rook a8 um, could work at all. And I have some belief that this might work. Now I have a choice. Do I play d3? Or do I bail out with bishop takes a2 like I've been thinking about? d3 seems much more aggressive. Um, there's no way his knight can hit both these squares at the same time without being on c7. And it can't get to c7 this turn. So, like, if I play d3, um, yeah, I don't have to worry about him pushing the pawn while stopping me from playing bishop d5. He's got to pick one thing uh, to go after, but he can't pick both. I think d3, rook d1, I don't know. Bishop a2, rook d3. This is threatening doubling rooks on my seventh. It's very unpleasant, but... Um, the other thing is d3, knight d4, bishop d5. And then he could try pushing his e-pawn. Basically, his knight just can't cover everything, but it could cover a lot of things all at once. Um, bishop a2, knight d4, rook d8. Rook d1, protecting the knight. Um... So it would be helpful to have the rook on a2 in that line where he's protecting the knight. I think this is the way to go. Um, I'm pretty confident that's the way to go. Uh, because it's very difficult for his knight to span the entire board. Now he's got to pick between knight d4 and knight e7. Or rook d1, which I don't believe in. If rook d1, then I just play like d2 here. And if he moves the knight, then I have rook d8. If he plays rook e7, then his rook's in the way of the pawn. If he plays knight d4, um, I could take on a2 one of two different ways. There's just so many variations here. Oh, <laughs> Another little factoid. Now that my pawn's on d3, I'm threatening rook c2, pinning this. And even the discovered, ch uh, the discovered attack on the c2 rook doesn't really help him that much. As opposed to if I played rook c2 immediately, that just loses a rook. But now rook c2 might actually be okay. Okay, so... That's complicated, because um, I've got <laughs> I've got rook c8 here, guys. <laughs> Does anybody believe in rook c8? How great would it be if that were the move here? Rook c8, knight e7, king f8, knight takes rook, um, bishop d5. What a mess e6, rook g2, king f1, rook h2, e7 check. Um, probably not a good idea. Probably not the best variation. But it is a idea among many. Um, do I have variations with like, I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff going on in this position. It's very difficult to calculate. 
We've got D2. Um... I want to take a2 before he takes on b4, and I just get screwed. That's so tempting to just do the obvious thing. Um, I could play h5 or h6. Then he takes on b4 play b3, he plays a4. My time is very limited there, but that might be something. Um, b3, knight d4, bishop d5. Ah, this is so confusing. If b3 pawn takes, I've helped his rook activate on my 7th. That's not good. Yeah, so that bishop a2 idea is starting to come back to me now. Um, bishop a2, rook takes, rook takes, knight takes. Um, bishop c4, I guess. Uh, the tempting move here would be d2. Just putting all my eggs in one basket and hoping it works. And I'm not seeing what's so wrong with it. d2 takes takes because knight can't cover d1. I think if there is anything, oh, if I d2, ah, knight takes, he's got no discoveries, but he's protecting this a2 pawn, but I've got rook c8 there. d2, rook e7, gets in the way of a knight fork. I think it's got to be d2 here. So, yes, he can protect his a2 pawn, but no, I don't think he has time to take on b4 um, and deal with everything else I'm doing. Which would suggest a king move, except the king moves put the king on light squares, except for king f2, which allows for um, d1 queen check. So... Um, my thought is that probably best is rook d1, um, but if that's his best move, then I've got rook c2. Oh, then he's got king f2. That's tricky. But no, rook c2 also hits the knight on c6. So probably rook d1, rook c2. Rook b4, rook takes knight, rook takes d2. And he's got two pawns for a bishop. Um, alternatively, you could consider knight d4 as a means of trying to stop me from playing rook c2. But then I have rook c8. And then if rook d1... Um, yeah, no. It's possible d2 is just pushing the pawn up too quickly for him to stop it. Um... That's really optimistic of me to say that. So he's got rook b4. If he does rook b4, I've got rook c2. And he could stop my pawn, as well as stopping rook c1 check, but he can only do so at the cost of his knight. Um, yeah, this is messy. I'm not seeing a way that he can counter all of my threats, though, being this thing, this thing, um, sometimes this, but not really. Of 
granted, he doesn't have to take this stuff, but... I mean, he could play like h4 or something. He could play a4. Well, no. I guess I am threatening rook c2. That's pretty forcing. Oh, yeah, and then this has two threats of rook c1 and rook c6. So it's like he's off by just a single tempo from dealing with all of my rook to the c file threats. Um, that would be amazing if he had some miracle where he was taking, like, knight takes on e6 and then rook takes g7. And then somehow his other rook made it to the 8th rank before I had time to promote or deliver a check or something like that. That would be spectacular. I don't think that's the case here. Um, now rook c8 is discouraged by his knight. But that, yeah. <laughs> I think... I think the rook c2 is decisive, except in cases where he's done something to prevent me from playing rook c2, but then I have rook c8 instead. Right. So, if he can enlighten me as to what I've missed here, um, that would be helpful. So yeah, I've got the rook c1 fork. But I'm also threatening rook takes c6. So I'm attacking a knight and I'm attacking a fork. Um, so that's a rook fork if there ever was one. My head hurts. <laughs> I suspect my audience has probably gone off to watch some master play this event. Because it's difficult being able to view the game and hear my thoughts about it, but it's difficult to do that and not comment on it. Um, so, yeah, now I have to take this. Okay, so we escaped into a decent endgame. I was about to play bishop takes pawn like a dummy. Um, possibly I have better than that. By possibly I mean that hangs a piece. Don't do that. Um, if I played rook a8, he would play a4. So I think we need to double the rooks in order to exchange a rook. Oh. That's an interesting way to play. Um, I don't understand that at all. I'm guessing my opponent doesn't either. Okay. That was very, very unexpected. Because, like, what's he going to do with the rooks? Exchange a rook? Is that what he wants to do? That really doesn't seem like the sort of thing he'd want to do in this position. If I can leave him a choice, like if he plays rook d6, I take on d6, and he has a choice between pawn takes, which isolates his pawn, or rook takes, which drops the a pawn. Right, so he's playing a4 here, which makes sense, um, but allows me to get behind the pawn. And now, thanks to having played um, h6, I don't have to worry about getting mated. Now, if his works were like on the b file instead of the d file, this would be a lot scarier. His rook on the d-file doesn't have much room to maneuver to hit my bishop. Um, 
So if he plays rook d6, I can pretty fearlessly play king f7 here. If I had to. Uh, that's weird. Check, sir. So the super tempting thing for white is just to block the check. Um, to blithely ignore any calculation that would be necessary. Um, or to realize just in futility that nothing's better. Um, but this is not what white is aiming for here. White doesn't have a pawn break, and because he lacks the pawn break... Oh, wow. Okay, that's unexpected. Um, I think I can just collect the A-pawn now. It walks into a temporary pin, but... In fact, no, it doesn't. I just take on d3 rather than playing bishop c4. Bishop c4 would be the dumb way to try to collect the a-pawn. Um, I just take on d3, he has to do rook takes, and then I take the a-pawn. And then we see if we can trade rooks or not after that. And again, this is where it would be helpful to have the rook like not so close to the bishop because the bishop covers these squares around uh itself but yeah there we go okay how did we get here uh this is a Rui gone weird oh yeah this is my Rui thing um how can i improve upon this so i don't play like i know i do this in blitz um but how do i improve upon this for tournament play Okay, scroll down, scroll up. Nobody realistically plays this as white. Um, bishop f5 would be a way to play this without giving myself all the weaknesses I had in the game. Um, yeah, so bishop f5 would be a way to play this. Castle. Either bishop f5 or rook e8 would be fine. Um, as played by uh, these fellows. Oh, apparently the higher rated of the two people who got that position with black played for e8. That's cool. That's an interesting way to play it. All right, so that's that opening. Did the evaluation graph suggest... Well, I guess that we haven't analyzed my game, but... I'm optimistic that I played it well. Not necessarily the best, but I played it okay. How about we do one more? We've been here two and a half hours. At least those of you who are sticking with me have been here for two and a half. I suppose that those of you who haven't been sticking with me haven't been here that long. In either event, um, yeah, I think one more will do it. We're in 190th place, um, which is not the greatest. Only because we're down 10 rating points from when we started the event. But I've been trying some ideas with varying levels of success. Okay, so we're going to do the Queen's Gambit again. Okay, this is much more common in my experience. This being the Queen's Gambit declined. So I've built up some level of experience with this. Um, I wonder if I could just... No, let's do the thematic thing and play Knight C3 here. Yeah, we got some 3D pieces. Is that what's driving people away? I wonder. It's like, this is the theoretical challenging stuff. If I remember right, because now white's threatening to take on f6 and play for e4. Um, 
Or I could just play e3. No, the thematic thing here, I think, is rook c1. Um, I'm trying to defer the decision of whether to play e3 or e4 until I need to make such a determination. And I've played the Catalan a few times, with so that being the g3 and bishop d2 idea. It's not that exciting. Um, so... I think this is the point where I'm supposed to take and then play e4. And okay, black has committed no sin or no error here, but... Um, no, black's error is that it's difficult for him to move his c-pawn now. So I could just push c5, but I don't have any way to back it up. Um, interesting. c5, b6, e3 looks okay. Like, generally, black has already played rook e8 and is threatening to play e5 in this sort of structure. But here he's failed to do so, so I'm just going to push past. Now, granted, that releases tons of pressure on this d5 square, but it was overprotected anyway. Okay, so I didn't predict that. I guess b5 is his next idea here. So my idea, I guess, is bishop d3, bishop b1, queen d3, and checkmate. Um, I mean, to whatever extent he wants to open up his king side to help me out, I guess I'd appreciate it. Oh. I can't defend that very easily. Um, but his c6 knight is hanging, so I just take and then take on d5. And that's a free pawn. Uh, granted, I've not developed, I've not castled, but a free pawn is a free pawn. Unless I'm losing my a pawn, then it's not so free. Um, I'm starting to appreciate why this is not the book. Hmm. Okay, so I guess this is a gambit. Whatever. I should have just taken b6. If I'd taken b6, okay, yes, the pawn structure is symmetric, and there's nothing in my favor here. But here I'm just down a pawn, and I've given up the center. Okay, I have some vague mating attack threat, but it's not going to manifest itself. I did get a tempo from him doing bishop takes, but that tempo can't possibly be worth the pawn. As enterprising as anybody playing this may be, that tempo of bishop c5 and bishop e7, there's no way that could possibly be worth the pawn. Um... All right, let's go back. Only because the bishop's a huge target on d3, and I've got this nice cheapo I want to line up. That's actually not entirely a cheapo. It's not so easy for black to contend with it. Um, Black's got to make some kind of concession to deal with my attack. Or uh, you could just pretend I'm not attacking and then when it, the stuff hits the fan, um, it's going to be a surprise. Um, that's a way to play it, too. So... Do I take an f6 now? That allows them to play f5 in the overwhelming majority of these lines. I want to play bishop g3. It encourages e5, but I don't have a way to take d5 profitably. Or do I? Um, this is curious. If I play queen d3, if they play knight b4, um, I've got queen d4. 
and they can't play e5 because their knights moved, but they could play c5. Okay. So I guess the move, the prophylactic thing I should do is play a3. But then that encourages e5. And then if I play my queen somewhere, they just push e4. Um, that doesn't tactically work out. Hmm. Can I play e4 here? e4, d4, um, knight e2, e5 is not so great. Um, this stuff is tricky. I want to have my rook on d1, but I have no way of getting there without ruining everything. Um, There's also e4 and the knight takes e4. Yeah, that's most unpleasant. So I keep thinking that a3 is my prophylactic move here. Um, I'm not sure that it gains me a whole lot. But I think I need that space. Otherwise, I don't have anywhere to maneuver my pieces in because of this damn knight. Um, but now, this having been played, black just plays e4. I want to say e4, but that's e5, even though it's black playing it and taking the center. So this is looking a lot like um, some kind of Nidorf gone wrong. Um, however many Tempe up or down that is, uh, it just, just doesn't look right. So the best I can do, I think, at this point would be lull him to a false sense of security and then try to win it somehow. Um, yeah, good luck with that plan, right? Okay, so... I'm not a big believer in this move. I'm thinking that I have ideas of queen c2 and then pawn takes f3 and king g1 or king h1 rook g1 but also um hmm, I don't even know if I have to go into any of that this knight on e5 oh could go to c4 that's the point I was gonna say otherwise it doesn't have anywhere to go but it could go to c4 either way bishop g3 gains a tempo um Hmm. Tricky stuff. So, I kind of like the idea. Yeah, thanks for helping me cheat. This is a rated competitive game, so I'm not going to do that. Um. Even though I was about to suggest I have this idea and I could hit the queen for a tempo, I'm not even sure that winning the pawn is worth it. Um, I just want to develop my pieces like this. And if he takes on f3, okay, whatever. I'm not too concerned about it. If there were a way I could play king h1 and bishop g3 at the same time, that would be interesting. 
But here, I think these squares are important. This stuff is important. Um, even this hitting the queen, taking some more squares, and threatening to play rook. Either rook to d1, really. All these things are useful. I think I'd rather have all these positional benefits um, than to have the c-pawn um, and accelerate my opponent's development. Um, also here I've got bishop e5 threatening to mate him. I think he missed that. I guess it doesn't mate by force or anything like that, but this certainly makes Black's life uncomfortable. Now that I'm threatening, bishop takes f6. I actually expected e5 last turn, and then I could start trying to undermine the center. Um, all the while, the c-pawn is still loose. But here, I could just take f6 and then queen h7 check. And, okay, it's not mate, uh, but I get the h-pawn. That's not bad. It'd be nice if I could trump this up a bit. Um, in fact, like if I could move this knight away and then fork his king and rook, or queen and rook, uh, that'd be great. If I could like bring my knight over here and actually mate him, that'd be pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of stuff that could work a lot better than it's working at the moment. Um, but still, this taking f6 and queen h7 thing seems pretty fun. It's just, it'd be more fun if there were more to follow it up with. Um, I think there would be more to follow it up with if I actually did knight e2, and then took on f6, and then take his c-pawn and start invading on the 7th. That seems more profitable. Or actually, bishop takes c7, queen takes, knight takes d5. Uh, I've given up two pieces if he does knight takes. And then if I recapture, um, he takes my queen, I take back. I've still given up two pieces there. That's too generous. Um, but if I could find some way to like, take on c7 and gain a tempo while hitting the queen... And he doesn't have a way to like recover with his queen uh, with tempo. That would be awesome. Um, inverting the move order sometimes helps, like knight e4. Uh, pawn takes, bishop takes c7, queen moves, bishop takes a rook. Problem is I want to take there and then take the queen for free. Um, well, actually, wait a sec. No, he takes a d5 the knight. Uh, there's no way to get that to work, because this damn knight is too good. Um, so, Another idea well, would be king h1 and rook g1, trying to do something there. I'm not sure that that works any better. Um, I just want one more tempo somehow on that side of the board, and I don't see a way to get it. I also looked at knight a4, but I didn't have any way to follow that up reasonably. I could play knight a4, take on c7, and then go back and then win the h-pawn. I'm just losing so much time doing all that. And my knight is so misplaced on the path of this pawn and rook. I don't want to face any of that. Um, I 
think this is reasonable for reasons that I just struggle to explain. It just seems like the right thing to do here. Because I want my knight on the king's side. Either for to benefit my own king, or to try to help in some sort of attack. Um, like if I could get that knight onto h5 with tempo, that would be fantastic. In fact, why don't I just play like knight g3, knight h5, and sack the knight, going for mate? That seems reasonable. Let's try it. Because <laughs> his bishop is tied down to this knight. Okay, so he's running the king away. So now I can't play the knight move, or at least it costs me a knight to do so. Knight h5, knight takes, queen h7, knight back, check, knight blocks, check. King e8, queen takes knight, king d7. So he barely escapes that. Um... Hmm, the other thing is I'm still threatening to chomp on c5 in all these lines. I just don't want to win a pawn when I could get more. But I don't think I have more here. Takes, takes, knight h5, e5, queen h7. It's not so simple. I should take this knight. It's too good. My bishop's not good enough. That knight is fantastic. We have to get rid of it. And then follow that up with this move. And then he can't hold this pawn unless he plays bishop g7 and then I have knight h5 to stop that from holding together. Um, granted, I'm dropping b2 to do all of this, so... Snatching kingside pawns may or may not be worth it. Time will tell. Um, and if I have to sack an exchange, that's not terrible either. Though I probably should have given that some more thought before diving into this. In any event, queen takes c5 is not a good idea because then he just takes b2 at the end, and the end game's not at all favorable. But this thing where I have a kingside attack, who knows? There might be something. Probably not, but there might be. Um, okay, I'm thinking I should play b4. Just trying to blast all of this open. Oh, it gets my queen almost trapped. That's unpleasant. Do I need to play bishop g6 first? Um, the only piece he can hold that kingside with would be this rook on f8. Um, we're going to go for it. If I back down now, everything hits the fan, so we have to go for it. Especially because he's doubled down into, like, what seems like a very impractical decision to try to hold everything. Um, like, if he tried some sort of less committal defense, um, I could maybe argue that... Um, I've gotten something, he's gotten something, that's okay. That's a fair trade. But here, he's just going uh, for the jugular outright, and I don't believe that that's a reasonable approach while I have so many pieces attacking. He's trying to trap my queen, and I think that's a bit greedy. I think that costs uh, his king's safety a bit. If he takes my pawn, I'll recapture. OK, 
Okay, so yeah, he gets my beep on. That's okay. Um, so now I've got rook c7, bishop d7, bishop f7, rook f7, rook d7, king takes, queen takes, bishop e7. And then I lift my other rook. Unless I want to do anything before doing that big combination. Like if I want to throw in knight h5 first. I think knight h5 first might help. Knight h5, bishop d7 is the one concern I have there. It gives him a tempo, but then I take the bishop a tempo. So I'm not sure what he's going to do about this threat. He's got to move the bishop. But in so moving it, um, my combinations become just a tiny bit stronger, I think. Like bishop e oh, he's got the c7 square covered. That's not good. Why am I thinking about these things in abstract and not looking at like concrete covering of square things? This is not good. Um, I've taken away the square from my bishop. This is really going all in, um, in a position where I really shouldn't be doing so. Okay, so yeah, I mean, if I could get rid of cover of the c7 square, I might be able to continue this, but this looks very difficult to pursue. Um, if I push e4, he just pushes d4. And if I do anything else, he just pushes the a pawn. So I think I have to push f4 here. That allows bishop d6. My reason for going into all this in the first place was that if this bishop moved, then I could take on h6 and g5. But I can't do that because it hangs my bishop. Um, f4, pawn takes, pawn takes, bishop takes. No, all this, like, even when his queen recaptures on f4, that doesn't help me a bit. Um doesn't help me at all. So do I have to retreat this bishop and then if queen h4 just lose? Do I have something better? I think I got way too greedy. I don't know how to pull out of this attack um, without losing everything. Jeez, do I really have to like play bishop b1 and queen c2 to get out of this? Um, and even that doesn't really save me at all. Do I have to play knight g3 and grovel a bit? I think this is the most principled thing I can do here. But nobody enjoys groveling. Um, but here I kind of have to. So this frees me up to play bishop h5 and then take the h-pawn and be only down one pawn. Of course he's not going to take my knight, but he could. Really, I think this is probably a reasonable approach here. I'm not seeing any way to counter it. Um, that's not a good thing at all for me that I don't have a plan. Um, yep, I've certainly seen better positions. So I guess what's happening in some of these games is that I'm playing 
don't know, I keep trying to extract more and more and more of an advantage in positions where I just need to liquidate and win it. Uh, or liquidate and attempt to win a slightly superior position as opposed to just um, trying to win it all at once. Um, right. Right, right, right. So big idea was going back here. So it frees my queen to move. And then once my queen is free to move, I can take a pawn or two and maybe not be completely lost, but just mostly lost. Um, he wants an exchange. I'm half tempted to just let him take it. But, I don't know, dignity kind of demands them to do something more than that. So I've got this square covered with my knight. That might be a reason for him to consider taking my knight. Not saying it's a good reason, but it is a reason. So the variation would be bishop takes knight, pawn takes bishop, bishop e2, rook b1, or even rook c7. Rook c7, king moves, and then rook b1 because my queen covers this. Um, could be a shot. I have some chances here. No, that's okay. I mean, what else is a person viewing this going to do but suggest ideas? Um, and it is fun to kind of converse about the position. It's just when people start giving very specific moves, it's difficult to... I don't know. Um... Right, so I'm not seeing his point. Like, that traps his queen. That's pretty weird. So I guess I'm just going to pull back. I guess that does defend the h-pawn. And defending the h-pawn does bring a threat of rook h8 trying to trap my queen. Um, I guess more constructively, um, like, okay, he can start rolling his pawns on the king's side. Okay, that makes absolutely no sense. Like, these other moves have confused me. This move... I don't have words for how much that confuses me. I want to call that a blunder, but considering my rate of accuracy at calling out blunders today, um, I'm not going to call that out, but come on. At a bare minimum, I'm threatening bishop takes e6. And if king takes, I've got queen, a, queen f5, and this king defends the bishop somehow, and I don't know exactly what goes on there, but that's at a bare minimum if I have nothing else. That's one thing he has to think about here. But another is just pawn takes pawn, and I'm just really not seeing what he's up to. Oh, I'm sorry. So if I do bishop takes, that does let his queen out. So that would not be wise. But basically anything I could play here looks playable. Like, this looks very strong. Especially if I could decoy this pawn away, then I have this knight fork. Um, but if I can't remove the this pawn, and if he just takes on g3, um, that's not great for him either. Right, so he wants to get this kingside rolling, I guess is his story. Um, I have ideas too, you know. 
Just because I blunder over and over doesn't mean I have no ideas. And some respect is in order. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's probably game. Like, the obvious threat in the position is if he does bishop takes, pawn takes, and his queen's trapped. Um, but he didn't do that. Uh, less obvious is that this just wins a queen. Or possibly mates if I take the bishop. Um, okay. Yeah, I think he just freaked out because my time was running out. Some players do that. I am curious what happened this game. And I'm exhausted, so I'm going to have the computer help me figure it out. Um, but also, let's take a look at our opening. Scroll all the way up to the top. So this is a queen's gambit declined with rook c1. Is rook c1? No, e3 is most topical. Queen c2 is next most topical. Rook c1 is third choice. Okay, yeah, I was saying knight c6 didn't seem right. But that doesn't mean c5 is correct either. Probably knight c6 is just not in the master database um, for a multitude of reasons. Um, the most obvious being that it just doesn't give black anything for the move. Um, but I didn't counter it correctly. It was definitely enough to stun me. Okay, so I should just play e3 here, apparently. And this results in play similar to the game, except white controls the center and has the bishop pair. And black doesn't have any pawn breaks because the meaningful pawn break c5 is like a million light years away. Um, and while I don't trust all these moves from the engine, at least that's something worth considering. Um, so we left book a while ago. And where did this, how did this go? I played bishop d3, which was inaccurate. I should have just taken b6, like I mentioned. Um, black took c5, which I thought gave white a lot of play. Yeah, what, black could have just continued development and have a decent position. Uh, but the way this played out, I got some compensation, although then I played queen c2 because I didn't know what to do. Like you pointed out, I could just win the pawn and have an equal position that's pretty boring. Um, which, that's an option. But that says that I played this wrong to begin with. I was trying to play some interesting chess, and I think things got too interesting for my own good. Yeah, I fully expected e5. Um, and then I was considering rook d1. I wanted to play rook cd1, but rook fd1 seemed more reasonable. And then try to liquidate some of this stuff, and I guess I get a pawn. That's the moral of the story. Um, and this end game is pretty equal. Um, but yeah, I expected e5 there. Um, instead I get this. Oh, so I was saying knight a4. This definitely occurred to me. I just didn't think it was that good. Like, you can't just say, oh yeah, knight a4, good move. You can't just say that, you have to back it up somehow. I wasn't sure whether queen takes or bishop takes is more appropriate here. Bishop takes is a lot safer and gains a tempo. Um, what's the deal with black giving up the exchange here? Why doesn't black just run away? Uh, like rook e8. Knight b6 and a4. A4, queen b4, rook to d1. I guess black just really doesn't like this position and would prefer to give up the exchange than to get here. That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, okay, yeah, I this is beyond my ability to understand, but I found this move. Found this, 
Apparently I should have played b4 straight away here. Um, don't understand that. Oh, that's cool. Check that out. Okay, we'll take it. And then that allows me to get this fork. Okay, that would be an amazing tactics trainer problem, because nobody's going to find b4 here. Like, worst case, black just gives up the pawn or something, but he's not able to do that here. Um, so he's forced into a position where he's got to give an exchange. Okay, so we do take, and then I kind of put my queen off sides instead of um, being able to invade to the seventh rank. And I just engage a completely misdirected attack, and finally, the one move position, I should have played bishop h5. Just trying to collect the pawn. I messed even that little bit up. And just got a bad position. And didn't see any way to try to recover this. Um, I guess e4 puts up some resistance, but it's tricky. Uh, rook b1, I guess, puts up some resistance. All this is tricky again. There's just mistakes from both players. And then d4 here, like I said, just doesn't seem to make any sense. And Stockfish says that white's ahead by 8 here. Um, at least even after my move. And then I go back and, yeah, I'm just superior in this position. So, we'll leave it to you all to go watch the rest of the 4545 League Anniversary Tournament. Go check out other streamers. I'm sure they're streaming this. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.